a webinar based on component three of the project, uh, which is enhanced regional diagnostic protocols, tools and information platforms fit for purpose in cassava systems in Southeast Asia. Um, <clears throat> just for those who are joining us from outside the project, uh, this project is funded by the Australian government through the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research um, and has also got co-funding from the RTB, uh, the CRP RTB, Rich Tubers and Bananas. And as you can see, it uh, is supported by a number of partners within Southeast Asia, uh, including in-kind support from China with CATAS and Thailand with Kesasat University and TTDI. You can follow the project activities and the, the presentations and recording will be uploaded on the, the website um, once we have that prepared. So you can catch it later as well. In terms of objectives in uh, objective three, um, you can see here the six uh, activities that were outlined in the proposal um, from capacity building to implementing surveillance, understanding the distribution of white flies, developing rapid field diagnostics, uh, working more on the biological characterization, um, particularly for witches' broom, and then developing effective communication products. Uh, the component of the project has been working very hard and in a challenging year. Uh, 2020 with being able to get out into communities uh, to implement some of the activities, but they've achieved a lot. And I think we have a, a much better handle on what's happening at, at the moment. And I'll let the, the presenters update you for each of the countries. Importantly for the project, these activities inform other parts of the project, be it informing the economics and the business models about where we uh, might set up rapid multiplication, uh, informing the, the breeding in terms of what varieties that farmers are currently growing are least susceptible and more susceptible. Uh, so yeah, the, the orange components are what we're largely hearing about today. But of course, these really do inform the other activities. So it's great that we can catch up and share information and start to plan for, for next year. Just to highlight that, I'm, I think everyone in the region knows that the cassava um, prices at the moment are some of the highest we've seen for a long time. This is the Thai, Thai prices that I've just put up um, where root prices are on the increase, but not, not to the extent that we're seeing in Vietnam. Uh, starch demand's fairly constant, but it's really the demand for cassava chips is, is fueling the, the market at the moment with that demand from from China. Uh, I don't want to go into that too much today, but we will we'll come back to that next year and we'll have a seminar to update what's happening in the market at the moment. But as I said, the, the root prices are, are very high at the moment, uh, even higher than they were this time last year when they were already uh, you know, starting to peak. So this it means a lot of things. It means that farmers are going to be looking to replant as quickly as possible and, and you know with the, on the back of those good prices stems are going to be moving around as area expands so it's really important that we know where the disease diseases currently are uh, and where there's potentially areas of non-infected material that could be used to to um, sell and distribute to farmers through the, the value chain in areas that are looking to expand so today we will have seven presentations. So move quite quickly. Um, we're going to start off with Dr. Wilma Corella, the component leader, uh, and then the reports from each of the, the countries, uh, finishing with uh, Dr. Mike Mason from UQ and Dr. Maria Isabel from, from SEAT talking about the white fly. So with that, I'm going to ask Wilma to take control and um, share his screen. Wilma, are you online? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, ah, thank excellent. you. Thank you. Let's, uh, yeah, uh, a short presentation. So let's let me go uh, to the 
PowerPoint. Please uh, let me know if you can see uh, the presentation. Yeah, we can. Great, thanks. Okay. So, as, as John already uh, indicated, this is about activity three. Is uh, we are talking about the establishing sustainable solutions to cassava disease in Southeast Asia. And um, these presentations are part of the objective three on diagnostics and surveillance. Uh, what I want to emphasize from the beginning is even though this was a, a difficult year, as, as John mentioned, because of the COVID-19 situation, the work we're presenting uh, uh, today is, uh, has a lot to do with the great team work that has been happening on this activity in uh, the countries with the, with the regional partners. Here we can see the, the team from uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and uh, Thailand. The group from uh, Dr. Wambisa Siriban also helping us to standardize the protocols for diagnostics and surveillance from the beginning. And uh, uh, in the bottom part of that of this slide, you can see people at SEAT, the names of the people at SEAT involved in, in standardizing the diagnostics tests and running the, uh, the guides and, and the protocols that were shared with all of you. So we started, uh, uh, I think it was about by the end of, of last year, uh, setting some priorities. Yeah, this, it, it's important to realize that these are expensive activities, uh, field sampling and molecular diagnostics. So we have to consider these and the available resources when we want to organize uh, these, these kind of activities. Uh, so I, I put some numbers here, how we came out to the 60, uh, the number 60, uh, number of samples that we're collecting per hectare of cassava field. And, uh, the probability that it, it gives us, yeah, we can detect with, with this number of samples with a, with a good probability uh, up to 5%, from 5 to a uh, higher percentage of uh, prevalence from, from, in this case, CMD. The same would be for cassava brown, uh, cassava, which is broom disease. This is based on the symptoms. Uh, the probability increases uh, if we do molecular diagnostics because we can uh, detect the pathogen even before the, the symptoms are, are shown. We have to realize that there is no 100% uh, certainty that the pathogen is not present if we uh, detect in this uh, zero, zero PCR positives in these 60, 60 samples. But we can say that with 95% confidence that if the pathogen is present, its prevalence is below this 5% uh, number. So we have to think about this every time we, we interpret the data we get from the field. And we, I put uh, here uh, an example. This is an example we got from uh, one field in the south of Laos, uh, when, where we, we detected, or the team detected four symptomatic plants out of 60. And you can say that uh, you have a, a percentage of 6.67 symptomatic plants, but when we ran the PCR, we found that 11 of those were actually infected. We will talk more about that. This is based on the first trial we did uh, at the end of last year, together with a group from Thailand, where we started with uh, checking sample sizes of 30 samples per field, per cassava field. And then this year, we started using this protocol, tested also here in Colombia, in cassava, and we created a profile for the for this project in the best displays platform. You can all well, you all receive the instructions to access this information. And here is a list of the people that is uh, has access to the, the maps and the and the information on the project. The code of the project in the platforms in the platform is 00063. And as you can see, you can have the name of the guests, uh, the partners, donors, you can add upload also references that support uh, these, these activities. Uh, we can use here the protocols and also any publication that comes out from these activities. And you can also go to the samples. When you go to the samples, you check the, the photographs and you can uh, check the symptoms. Uh, but not, not only that, that now we can also go to every sample and update information with the results that comes from the laboratory. So if you are running PCR with the protocol that we are all testing, uh, you can up, up update the information for that sample in that field. So uh, this is a new um, update of the, of the platform. So I will be uh, organizing soon another, another online training to 
how to access the information, how to find information you, you're looking for in the platform. So uh, by October this year, we collected almost 13,000, uh, more than 13,000 data points, images, and uh, biological samples. Uh, and is, if you see, the yellow part indicates all the samples that have been confirmed by uh, symptoms, presence of symptoms, and there is a very thin uh, uh, line of red there. I don't know if you can distinguish it. That indicates that we are uh, the, the samples that were confirmed by PCR, by molecular diagnostics. This is the part that is lagging behind. Uh, uh, so far, SEAT, uh, the SEAT lab here in Colombia has been supporting this uh, uh, diagnostic test. Uh, it's also help us to standardize the, the method, but uh, it depends also, uh, this, will be, this will be uh, improved as uh, far as the laboratories in the, in the regions start uh, uh, developing the capacities to run the test themselves in their laboratories. So uh, why do we do this molecular bio diagnostics? Uh, it will help us to compare the prevalence of infections versus the prevalence of the visual symptoms. Yeah? The test must be affordable, rapid, because of the scale that we are working uh, for the sampling. And the probability will depend on the ability of the visual recognition of the symptoms and the sensitivity of the method, of course. But as I mentioned in a previous uh, slide, we have to take into account the, the budget situation, so the costs for this. So we need to standardize this DNA extraction protocols, private sets, symptoms, identification. I think we have, we so far, all the teams we are working, or we are testing at least the same protocols, and uh, we agree on start with the CTAP nucleic acid extraction. Uh, and then after that, uh, I think the next one of the next steps will be to run interlaboratory tests. For example, here at CIAT, we already tested I think more than a thousand uh, samples. So we have the results for those. It will be interesting to see if the laboratories in the region can, can confirm this uh, or, or get the same results with the same samples once they have set up the, the, the laboratories there. So this is an example of what we are obtaining. So you have a set of uh, photographs with the symptoms of the, uh, of the plants that the, the teams are collecting and uh, the corresponding PCR for every sample. So that's how we can uh, see if a sample has a symptom or, and is PCR positive, or it doesn't show any symptoms, but is PCR positive. So far for CMD, uh, the large majority of samples that show symptoms are positive to the PCR. I think this 0.5% is due uh, to the limitations of the method. So samples that need to be repeated, but it's, it's really a, a, a minor number. Um, and all the protocols, the protocols to, to run these tests have been shared with, with all, the, all the partners. We lately were evaluating, I don't know if you can see this in your, in your, in your screen, but on the left side, you have a, a, a representation of what we are doing uh, for testing the tip sticks uh, that have been published by the, by the group in, in Australia to detect uh, or to extract more rapidly the DNA that we need to run the molecular diagnostics. So the method is great, it's really fast. It it's, uh, it's allows us to run the, to, to do the extraction and put the sample in the PCR uh, machine in, in less than one minute. And we, so we can do several samples uh, per day, much more than with CTAP, which requires larger processing time. But what we found is that uh, for asymptomatic uh, plants, the method does not perform as great as for symptomatic plants. This has to be due to the titers of the virus in the samples. Um, so for this, we will need, of course, to run some real-time PCR tests, but uh, so far the correlation is, is, is like that. More than 90% uh, of the plants uh, that show symptoms can be quickly detected by the doing extraction with deep sticks, but uh, less than 5% or around 5% with the, um, from the asymptomatic plants. So uh, in some cases, uh, like in Cambodia, where most of the plants show strong symptoms so far in all the, the, the fields, most of the fields that have been uh, surveyed, 
I think this could be a good alternative to confirm rapidly the, the presence of the, of, the, of the virus in those samples. Uh, in, in places where the incidence of the virus is n of the symptoms is not as high, uh, where, and where we suspect that there are an important percentage of plants that are asymptomatically infected, this uh, we should stick to the CTAP probably. Uh, we, because we have the samples and we, from the same pictures that we use to, to identify CMD, we can also identify cassava, which is broom disease, as you can see here in the two uh, photographs to the left. Uh, we are running, the, we are validating the, the, the current diagnostic for this phytoplasma, which is a PCR for the phytoplasma type, uh, type one. Uh, but as you can see here in the table on the uh, right corner of, your, of this slide, the correlation is not that great. Um, most of the plant that shows symptoms for cassava, which is blooming, we have tested two fields so far. Uh, most of these plants that show symptoms for cassava, which is bloom, are negative to this PCR, to this uh, type one. So um, this we have we have to continue running. Maybe we have to test other other types of phytoplasma, but these are the results so far. There are more samples coming from Laos. Uh, it's surprising that uh, um, we, in the photographs, in the almost 13,000 photographs that have been uploaded in the platform, we see symptoms of cassava, which is room only coming from fields in, in Laos, uh, not in, 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 in the fields from Cambodia or from Vietnam. So, so far we have the samples from Laos to validate the test for the test for uh, cassava, which is room. Uh, using the protocol that we are already using for CMD. So it's the same samples, it's the same DNA extraction, so we are just adding a PCR test uh, for different phytoplasma associated or supposedly to be associated to this to this symptom. So uh, this is not this not required to go to the fields again and collect samples and send samples again. It's it's basically working with the same DNA extract. There are still some adjustments to make. Uh, uh, we already discussed over uh, the internet with some of the teams. Uh, this is the first time I, I see, uh, maybe you have already seen this more, more often in the field, but this is the first time I see a plant that shows symptoms of both cassava witch's broom and cassava mosaic disease. As you can see to the left, this has to be confirmed, but uh, it's, it's, it was not so common. We were asking for, uh, for, for I think we, uh, we asked several times to, uh, to the teams in the fields that if they have seen this kind of uh, mixed symptoms, and uh, the answer was uh, uh, no. Uh, and and the, the photograph record is showing already this kind of situation. Um, there are some uh, improvement to the GPS location data that we have to make. There are some uh, provinces in Atapeo uh, that when we map the GPS data, they, they, they were located in Cambodia, not in, in Laos. So uh, we corrected this already. We, we contacted Noi, but um, this must be something with the telephones or the applications that are being used for the GPS location. But uh, there are not many cases uh, of, of this. And uh, also uh, there are some fields that even though they are far apart from, from each other, they, the, the team is recording only one GPS location. So we have, um, in some cases, four uh, different fields with the same location. So they will appear as one, one field. So this is something that we can adjust still uh, with the teams uh, doing the surveys. Um, because uh, this is also a, a part of a, a cluster, a research cluster from RTB, we are implementing genome surveillance uh, for Sri Lanka Kassam mosaic virus. Uh, basically because uh, we can if we can detect some uh, significant changes in the biology of the, in the genetics of the, of the virus, this could be correlated to uh, more or less severe symptoms observed in the field. So for this, we need to do complete genome sequencing. There are technologies that are already available. We are, we are using uh, the Flonkel variation of the nanopore uh, portable sequencing. Uh, and in 2020, we received a, a earmark project, uh, project from, uh, funded by RTB to standardize this method and apply to, to rapid uh, genome sequencing for viruses. Uh, Within this activity, we envision a training uh, course in, 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 in Southeast Asia uh, on this technology, but because of the COVID-19 situation, this had to be canceled. And this is an earmark project, so it's only one year. So we could not uh, uh, 
there is no carryover to, to complete this, this, this activity for next year. So that, but we can see how we can, uh, at the end, uh, maybe continue this as part of the, of the ACIR project. So this is the kind of uh, results we have so far. This, uh, uh, in, this, in the red circle, you can see all the genomes have been sequenced uh, corresponding to Sri Lanka Kasama virus in Southeast Asia. You can see also <clears throat> that uh, are already two main branches forming. Uh, they differ basically on, on a more, uh, uh, in a larger version of the rep gene of the virus. And uh, the, this one of the variants uh, was found so far only in Thailand, but uh, one sample from uh, Cambodia has already started uh, showing uh, this mutation. So uh, we, we need to sequence, of course, more, more genomes, but these are the preliminary results of evaluating the technology for see if it works to, to, to get complete genomes and affordable price. This is important, and I think that it's a future hip uh, for, for uh, to, 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 to the project because we can uh, detect, or, or actually when we run this metagenomic analysis for every sample, uh, we can uh, check for all the Gemini viruses that are uh, that can infect cassava. So, so far as you can see uh, the total number of reads, which is the total number of molecules that have been sequenced from the sample, are more than 1,000 on, on average. And then most of this, uh, the highest percentage of this, of this uh, information corresponds to Sri Lanka Kassam mosaic virus. And uh, you can see it's less, uh, less than 1%, 0% sometimes to the African variants of this virus. So this allows us, this method allows us to identify, uh, could allow us to identify quickly if we start seeing some reads or some genetic information corresponding to other isolates of the other species of the virus being introduced in the, in the region. And um, as I mentioned before, we are evaluating a cheaper technology called Flangle, which is uh, one tenth of the, of the price, uh, of the current price of the technology. Um, because of the report of the Kassaba uh, virus in China, which shows similar symptoms to the Kassaba disease, uh, we are starting also uh, organizing information for this virus uh, globally uh, to see if we can if we can also continue uh, analyzing this this virus in the samples we already have from Southeast Asia um, for cassava mosaic uh, common mosaic which is an RNA virus uh, the diagnostic requires a, another a, a few other step from RNA we need to synthesize uh, cDNA this is an expensive um, step in, in, in diagnostics. So we need to evaluate if we, we want to do this or maybe test a few samples first in a high risk uh, zones uh, that, uh, where we can start uh, testing this product. Communication. Um, so we were uh, in close contact with the teams. We were answering questions. Uh, sometimes uh, we uh, receive photographs uh, that are more like uh, show the symptoms um, of damage by herbicides so that you were confused with cassava, common, uh, cassava mosaic disease. It was at the beginning, but then uh, uh, little by little, we started to see that the, the team was more and more uh, uh, confident in, that, in identifying the, the CMD symptoms. This was most uh, clear in the team uh, from Laos because they were not uh, exposed to the, to the disease before in the, in the, in the country. So this was this was something that we we we, we could observe from the beginning. Uh, the material has been uh, all, all the confirmations and the, the, the laboratory test uh, com confirmations have been used in communication uh, meetings, and uh, also with the people uh, the team also is is heavily involved in in, in training in field training. And I think it has been very rewarding. I don't know if there is time, uh, John, to show how the people can access to the information in the platform, but if there is a couple of minutes, I can show that. Thank you. Thanks, Wilma. Uh, we might come back to that if we can um, at the end, if that's all right, um, to keep things keep things moving. But yeah, that would be great okay. um, if, if people who want to see how to access stay at the end and we can discuss that. Perfect. Um, so yeah, a lot of really useful information in there. I thought I'd take uh, the time to uh, let people know that Dr. Bozal from FAO in Bangkok is, is on the call, uh, who's also uh, looking at how he can support the, the regional network through TCPs. Um, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Bo. Uh, we have 
I think it's important we have a few questions if people are really burning to ask Wilma some questions now before we move on. So if there's any really burning questions, uh, please raise your hand or just open your mic and, and go for it. I don't, ah, uh, yeah, Bo, go for it. Uh, thank you, John, for your invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Wilma, I just uh, have a very quick question, and you report the, the, the incursion of uh, uh, the uh, CMD in Laos already. So two days ago, we just had a project meeting, and uh, Laos, uh, the MPP of Laos, actually report uh, just a suspected uh, uh, case of uh, CMD in, in his country. So I just would like to know how the results from your program can be uh, integrated together with, uh, with, the, with the FAO uh, you know, uh, T3 project. I think that it will be very, very uh, useful actually for, for us to bring different uh, like uh, uh, you know, parallel programs together to share the information, because I, I, I looks like to me the the uh, the how to say the leader of the NDPO working on the CMD is not so aware of the progress that you made through the Australia program. So just uh, curious, how uh, what would be the mechanism actually for us to you know to uh, uh, raise the ownership of the NPPOs of the country in uh, individual countries to you know, uh, to uh, benefit from a uh, different type of program on the, on the ground. Thank you. Th thanks, Bo. Uh, Thank you, Bo. I don't know, you know if you want to, to take on that question because I think it, it requires, you know, like the, the coordination of the whole uh, yeah. collaborators in the project. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, a, it's an important point Bo, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really surprised that that's the case. Um, that it's the same organization. Uh, so maybe um, Noe can update us a little bit there. And it's been officially signed by the minister that the CMD in Laos. So I'm surprised that if that was a recent meeting that that's, that's the case. Um, but for sure, uh, coordination between the, the projects, both in terms of surveillance and capacity building and extension efforts um, and communication uh, it's great if we can align and, and ensure that we're getting the maximum out of both projects so yeah i think there's we talk to um, the partners and about how we can make sure within the organizations the information is also being shared thank you thank you well mark I've got a question um, i mean we were in in the south of lao last week and there's fields with 100% infection uh, and there are clearly varieties that have been introduced from, from, in this case, Vietnam. Right next to fields of, of uh, old Thai varieties like Rayong 72 with zero infection, uh, sorry, do, zero symptoms. Do we have any idea in terms of the data that we've got at the moment, uh, like for the asymptomatic ones especially, what varieties they, they were? Uh, some teams, you know, have uh, recorded the variety uh, from, uh, information from the farmers, I guess. but in terms of confirmation by, let's say, using the, the DNA chip from the cassava genetics, we have not done that. But the, the DNA is there and the information is there, so, so it's something that we can, we can like a next step on, on, the, on the analysis of the, of the information. Yeah, okay. Okay, if there's no more burning questions, I'm going to, uh, we'll, we'll close and we'll have more questions later. And I'm going to ask Dr. Vuti from GDA if he could share his screen and give us an update on the activities in Cambodia. Thanks, Vuti. We can see your screen. That's great. 
Yes, good morning to everyone. I hope you are all safety from COVID-19. Okay, now I would like to present you about the status of the cassava disease in Cambodia. So uh, we have done so far for uh, Sevelen, we had choose 14 provinces to do the, the surveillance on the CMD disease and VG broom. You can see on this more detail, so I no need to read one by one because you can see all these things because we have only for 15 minutes, so I need to speed up. If you have any question at the end, we can talk, okay? So you can see in the map, the disease spread out full of the, the country. So the, the surveillance we have uh, choose to fill per village and the total of the of, of the of, of the of the uh, of the field we have uh, 150 totally. You can see in the in the map all all these disease spread out, and you know only the lower part, uh, not much because the location not not cassava growing area. So the surveillance protocol we follow by the by by SEAT, virology crop protection protocol. Yes, and. So the field data collection report, we have uh, write all the record like a survey ID, sample, lab code, and picture and cultivated crop location and data, and et cetera, you can see in the presentation. In here, you know the history of the CMD the first in the uh, 2015 we have found in the Mondo, uh, Ratanakiri province. Only one field we have found in that time. So now you can see in 2015 we have only one province, but all the year by year we have spread more and more. And until now you can see all these full of the of the plantation in here uh, the map show about the cmd distribution in 9 in 2019 you can see all this in the, the color are different so the color we indicated the percentage of the CMD. This, I show you about the, the location and province that had infected by CMD. So this, uh, I can, I, I think no need to explain because you already see more and clear, the province located in the border of Thailand. And you can see in, in, in that place, we keep room a little bit we had, and mostly the CMD. This probably here, you can see all this province below a uh, shared border to Thailand. And Sim Reap and Kampung Cham. Kampung Thom is the, the, the middle of the, of the country. So also Mdulkiri also, you know, a lot of cassava diseases, a lot of CMD. Also the Bantimian J, we have less compared with another provinces because most of people I think they bring the plant, the, the plant material from Thailand. But in the in 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 other province, mostly they got from the Vietnam 
Vietnam side, so a lot of diseases come out. Come out. This is the summary of the of the CMD diseases, and also the witchy broom. You know, witchy broom in this year we cannot found so much. We found only one province in Simbre province, only one percent of the witchy broom. But for the CMD, you know, we have a lot of 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 CMD. Mostly, mostly a hundred percent, you know, yes. But during the Sevilland, we have a lot of ch challenges. So you have no already we have flooded, and also we have a coronavirus disease, and also we have a lot of rain. You know, heavy rain. We could not do properly. This the project we have implemented about 40%. So we still by 60%. So we will do the next, you know, the next activity we have we have we do complete on this. So the next activity we have to the CMD and we keep room surveillance and prepare the sample by fly sent to sent to oversee for molecular identification. And I think one more activity, maybe we need to have the experiment on the diseases management. All of my presentation, yeah, if you have any are not clear, you can raise the question, please. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Verti. Yeah, a lot of work uh, traveling around Cambodia and uh, a lot of challenges this year. Um, but again, some of the highest prices we've seen for cassava roots at the moment. So I expect a lot of farmers will be looking to source uh, planting material from somewhere this year. Uh, my question is, is there anywhere in Cambodia without disease rather than with disease? Is there any district where there's a large percentage of area that you would say there's not much disease at this stage? You know, I, I mentioned about the, the, the not much disease, only the witchy broom. But for the CMD, we have found any cassava plantation full of the field, you know, mostly full of the field. So sometimes people can cut and and new planting, new planting again and again. So they lost a lot of money, a lot of investment for the cassava growing. That I make you, but for the the wiki broom, I think not not so not so really a problem for us in this year. A few a few a few three or four years we had the problem with the wiki broom so much, but in this year we cannot found. Yeah. Okay. Is there any questions for Dr. Verti? At this stage, otherwise we will we will move on and come back to questions. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Okay, thanks, Vuti. So from Cambodia, we're going to move next to Vietnam, uh, yep. and hear from the team from from PPRI, uh, Dr. Liam uh, from PPRI will yep. update us on this on the activities in Vietnam. Thanks, Dr. Liam. Thank you, Lu. I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Lady Hang from PPI. We will present to you on the activity have been undertaken and the result we obtained so far today. Okay, please show your dissertation on streets and present the result we get. Thank you.
everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, so uh, I'm Holly from PCRI. Today um, I'm going to present our activity during um, October uh, and so far, and so far. And um, Um, at first, um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the September activities sum, uh, summary um, that we uh, reported in, on, on, uh, in September last time. So um, on the set, uh, in September, we report some activity related to design and implement region, uh, regional surveillance for CMD and CWBD in, in Vietnam. And um, we, but at that time, we only do some, you know, uh, do some activity outside, you know, like um, in the field, in state of in laboratory. Uh, we got some results, like start the surveys in, in, in the northern midlands and mountainous provinces in Vietnam, uh, implement the surveillance for CMD, CWBD um, at 19 villages of 16 districts in uh, 12 provinces. And the total number of surveys field sampling is um, around 65 fields. And um, we also do some activity in the laboratory like uh, storage samples, lip samples and white fly samples. And, um, and um, the total, you know, the, the total of um, the tube collected, white fly tube collected are 19 in the Northern Vietnam. And um, today I'm, I'm gonna talk about the activity uh, in October so far. And we, we got some activities, the main activity is like implement regional surveillance for CMD and CWBD in the central and the Southern Vietnam with results shared in the common platform. And um, uh, we do sampling material proof preparation and same treatment. And um, we also um, have some, some activities in laboratory like nucleic, nucleic acid extraction. We also try to find the stand, a standard sign of um, a nucleic, nucleic acid extraction. And um, we do um, some detections of CND virus on some requested fields by PCR uh, by Dr. Wilmer. And uh, for now, we are, we, we're preparing some samples to share with CAT by uh, leaf samples and, and white fly samples. And you can see, I'm gonna go uh, in detail with some, some activities, like with uh, sampling material preparation and sampling treatment in, in our lab. And this is the way we are storage um, sa uh, samples in our lab. Uh, seems you know, the number of samples are you know, too many. So uh, we have to do like that. We have to keep it in, in the Ziploc bag and, and, and silica gel. And uh, we are gonna change silica gel every two months. Um, about the sampling location, uh, so far um, uh, in the Northern Vietnam, as I mentioned before, we finished uh, 70 fields of, uh, six, of 18 locations of, of 12 provinces in the northern Vietnam. And um, in the central of Vietnam, we got um, seven, uh, 47 locations in total that required uh, by CAD, but so far we just only finished 160 fields of 20, um, 29 locations of seven provinces. And now we have 18 locations remained. Like um, um, some provinces uh, like Quảng Ngãi, Huế, Quảng Trị, Bình Định. And um, only one location in Kantu. And you can see it. We got, we've got three regions um, in, in the central of Vietnam, the North Central, the um, Central Highlands, and the South Turn, and the Central uh, and the uh, South Central Coast. And um, in, uh, in September, uh, no, in, in, in November, 
We also finished um, 56 films of 14 locations of five provinces in the southern Vietnam, and uh, we, 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 we did finish it. Um, this is some photos of surveys we, we, we do, um, we take it during the surveillance. You can see it, there's some photos. I only show some photos um, in the central uh, and uh, in the south of Vietnam that we did recently. And um, this is some activities we do in our laboratory this year. That is some um, detections of CMD by PCR. Because um, we got um, a request from Dr. Wilmer to check some some asymptomatic, just only asymptomatic films because um, you know some films in the north of Vietnam we didn't have we didn't observe any any symptoms so uh, he just only asked us to check for six films and um, and um, that is um F until F14 F44 F49 F46 and F47. And uh, all of the samples uh, got negative with um, uh, CMD. This is some uh, photo results for it. And um, the final, the final activity we are doing now is um, to prepare some samples, lip samples, and um, white fly samples to share with CAC. Um, to be honest, uh, we did uh, finish uh, prepare it, but. Um, uh, because um, we, we need to wait for the um, import uh, the import permit from Colombia. So so far, maybe it, it, it's gonna take some days. And um, you can see us um, in total. We we uh, we carry out um, two. So far, we carry out two hundred and forty five fields of sixty one locations of twenty four provinces. And uh, we only have nine, uh, 18 locations remains, and um, they are gonna be finished in December exactly. And you you can see it all of them all of them the locations that um have not have not collected so far is they they are located in the central Vietnam because um only in the central Vietnam because of some problem. You um I'm gonna share you for now. You know um. At first, I want I want to talk about the terrain. You know, to be honest, um, I I used to mention to um Dr. Jono and Dr. Wilmer about the the list of locations before that um, uh, the 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 sampling location is fixed, and uh, we have to we have to go survey for um during uh follow the, the 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 list that list so. Uh, we have no choice to 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 choose the terrains of uh, cast of films. I want to talk about the difficult terrains of the sampling uh, sampling locations that you guys share. You can see it. This is some photo from it. You know, uh, most of uh, most of films uh, in the list in the sampling in the sampling list, um, you know, are hills and, and, and mountainous, mountains, you know, and um, they, yes, this is um, this way we have to, we have to, we have to do some surveys um, in the sure. north of Vietnam, yeah, in the north of Vietnam, you know, you, you can see the terrain, it's, it's really hard for us to go to reach any fields like that, you know, um, I, 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 maybe it's, um, the, the photo cannot, cannot, cannot say um, how hard it is, but uh, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to say um, the cast of the films um, are grown in the in, in in the sloping in the sloping hills or in the sloping mountain. It's really the high the the high hills, the mountain. And um, the second problem is um flat water. You know, um, maybe Dr. Chono knows exactly that um, because um maybe he he's in, in Laos so far, right? So. Uh, maybe he, he knows exactly the situation in, in central Vietnam recently. Uh, we got um, a huge flood water in um, 2020, and this um, this is again some um, our activity to 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 go to the base. And um, yeah, landslides also one of the the the, the factors 
against us to reach um, surveys. Um, I don't want to talk much about um, you know the difficulties um, in in this year like COVID nineteen because of COVID nineteen we have to you know postpone a lot of time for um, go to surveys of this project. And I also don't want to talk about too much about um, the difficulty of um, the terrain of, and, and the natural of the natural disaster. Um, I just want to show you guys um, the, the the current problem, and um, that's why so far we, we have not yet finished all the activities. But uh, we um, we are definitely finished it in, in December. And um, if you guys have any and and any uh, any idea uh, for the solution, uh, can you guys share it? So much we appreciate. And then um, this is our activity planned in 2021. Uh, it's just a little like um, the the your plan uh, provided by Seat, like designed. And we keep designing and and implement regional surveillance for CMP in Vietnam. And um, we also um, do some other activities in laboratory, like um, evaluate new technologies for rapid um, field diagnosis for CMD and uh, CWBD, like designed a test line primers for SLCMD or uh, CWB, or we we um, we do test some 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 complete diagnostic system in test about growing regions. And the uh, third activity is to uh, develop and evel evaluate the effectiveness of the commun communication products. And that, that we, we have not do it in this year because of COVID-19. And yeah, this is all our presentations. Thank you so much for listening. Um, do you have any, any questions, please ask me. Thanks very much, Hank. Yeah, it's uh, difficult to get to cassava fields in in lots of uh, lots of countries, uh, uh, and we appreciate the effort of your team to to get to those remote fields. Um, I've got a question about the north of Vietnam. I know that there was a small outbreak up in Lao Cai or someone somewhere. Has has that been controlled, or is is that still a, an issue? Yeah, uh, you can see it. Um, I, I, I am. I've mentioned that we have no symptoms films in in the northern Vietnam, right? So, um, that is um the result of the control of uh, Vietnam government recently. Okay. Yeah. Is there any questions from from the floor? Okay, we'll move on and come back to, and you can ask questions to everyone after that for this. So thanks again, Hang Lee and, and the team from PPRI. Uh, I'll ask Konsovan uh, Noi, if you are there, can you please share your screen and give us the update from, from Laos? Can, can you see my purple point? Yep, we can. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I would like to share uh, my silver land with the Kasawa disease. Uh, uh, for the activity number three that uh, we, uh, before Silverland, we 
we got the training from Wilmer for use the protocol for the sampling Wi-Fi and Kasava Music and Vichy's Boom. And also we, uh, for the design of the implementation for the sovereign that uh, we conduct the 10 province, we select that the province that they grow the cassava uh, that they have in uh, the north center and the south. And after that, we determine, uh, we select of the area where the list of uh, CMD disease and which is boom disease. For example, we select uh, the area where the border between Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and China. And also, we collect this, uh, the company feel who would import this cassava painting material from 2018 and 2019. And then we use the poster presentation to farmer to detect the CMD field. Uh, in 2020, we conduct in 10, 10 provinces, such as uh, in Salawan province, we conduct four districts, and one district in Sekong, five districts in Champasak, and five districts in Bolikamsai, one district in Atapu, and three districts in Vientiane province, and one district in Kamuan, and one district in Siang Huang, and two districts in Sai Sombun, three districts in Sayabuli, and one district in Luang Nam Tha province. Uh, for the server land, we correct this uh, seven, 70 field that follow up the protocol from Wilmer. We corrected the 60 sample for CMD and which is boom and Wi-Fi. And uh, for the observ observation field, is around more than 100 field that observation. We did not collect the sample. <laughs> First, when we uh, go to the survey, we interview uh, and edu educate of the CMD to farm. We talk to farmer before we go to the field. And then we go to the field to collect the sample. Uh, this is the result of uh, the survey. Uh, the ye yellow dots is the area where we conduct the survey. And the list also that we found the CMD in the south of Lao, especially two districts. One district in Zampasak province is Hong district. The area very near with uh, Cambodia. And also we found in uh, Sanam Sai province, uh, Sanam Sai district in Atatpur province. It's also the, uh, the district is very near Vietnam and Cambodia. So we found in, uh, <clears throat> now the total winlet that we found CMD is uh, R10 uh, winlet now. For in Champasak uh, province, uh, <clears throat> we, we found that the painting material, the farmer bring from Cambodia. But in uh, Sanam Sai district, on of the infected field, the painting material from Vietnam 
but it's not a farm company to import this from Thailand. Just uh, the farmer bring uh, painting material from <coughs> from a uh, neighboring uh, village or uh, bring from the cow scenes from Vietnam and from Cambodia. Yeah. But it's a uh, in uh, Champasak province, in a uh, home province, the area is not 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 so so wide by CMD. But in Atapu province, Sanam Sai province, Sanam Sai district, is very big field. It's around fifty hectare. They call the cassava, and they have a. Uh, CMD in the middle of uh, the, the area. Uh, for the diagnosis, some cassava sample we sent to Seattle, Columbia to confirm. And some uh, sample that we confirm in PPC. <coughs> And all of the Wi-Fi we sent to uh, Seat to Wilmer to confirm. Yes. So, uh, after we know that uh, CMD is a why in Laos, that we prepare some poster for sure to train uh, to farmer and to train to uh, local staff. This is the activity we, we, we did in Champasak uh, province. And also we did the, uh, discuss with the uh, director of the DOA, Department of Agriculture, to do a regulation of CMD management. And now we finish uh, order from uh, minister to uh, to work no. on CMD management. Okay. And and also we discuss with mm. uh, to eradicate. Uh, mm. CMD, we get okay. permission with farmer, and then we uh, help them to eradicate in a farmer field. And we make the, the information, to share information with the local staff and PPC. Uh, so we, uh, we can uh, share each other where the CMD is in the field. The local staff, they, they work with farmer. And then when we saw some uh, symptom of the CMD and they will be called to PPC. They call to us to uh, confirm and they collect some sample sent to us to, to confirm is it CMD or not. Yeah, this is the activity from, from Lao. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have some question, please. <coughs> Thanks very much, Noe. Um, yeah, it's great to see that that extension and, and knowledge sharing is happening with, with DAFO and, and the provincial authorities. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning that we were able to broker some arrangements with, with a USDA funded project that, that brought the provinces and districts in the south of Laos together, where the team presented um, some information which did result in in people in Atapur identifying um, the symptoms uh, and then the team could go out there 
but what we did realize that it had been there for two years already um, and farmers just thought it was a new variety um, so there is a lot of extension and information that needs to get out to people who haven't seen seen CMB um, and also to companies because the situation in Atapur was actually after the dam collapsed uh, a few years ago um, a company bought stems over for the villages that were impacted by the flooding but unfortunately it was probably I don't want to say definitely but it was likely that that's when the disease was introduced um, at that that time so it's important that we don't only educate farmers but also um, the companies that were previously moving stems around is there any questions for for the team from Laos uh, Noi did you want to mention uh, or comment on Bo's question before about um, the FAO project and and um, yeah, what the status officially is in Laos and, and why that may have been confused last week with FAO. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't join the project, but my colleague is Joy, it's a project. Uh, yeah, so uh, for uh, the, uh, we, we can share the information that uh, for uh, for the server land is now a uh, seed support this in in this year i think is is uh i think i i i already visit every province uh to detect the cmd so for fao support this i think uh if you can uh support us to work with farmer for example, now in uh, in Atapu province, in Sanapsai province, they have the big area is around 50 hectare. We, we should be work with them to eradicate and to help them to reduce the disease in uh, Sanapsai. And also, if, uh, because uh, next year, she has already supported to survey again. So uh, is maybe we have we have to talk with a uh, FAO leader uh, to design um, decide the area where we go and to decide uh, how much uh, chemical or how much uh, some reagent to work for diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, Jono, can I intervene? A very yeah, quick please. intervention. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, con I'm 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 so sorry. Uh, how sh should I uh, pronounce your name? And uh, uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much actually for your clarification, and uh, that's really uh, wonderful actually and helpful. And uh, what FAO would like to do is actually to really support, you know, our country, uh, uh, like uh, Laos as well, and to how, I, how FAO can bring, can add value on what you have already. So as you, as you just uh, uh, mentioned and also presented, so it looks like uh, the surveillance has been already conducted most of the areas, but you do need some additional resources actually. So in this regard, I, I really, uh, you know, uh, kindly uh, inquire whether you are able to, uh, you know, internally coordinate well, how these two projects can work together to, you know, okay. to make use of the resources more efficiently and effectively, you know, so our focal point of this project of FAO is uh, Sri Lampong. I'm not sure yeah. what is your work uh, relationship uh, each other and uh, if you can internally coordinate and uh, also keep FAO and the CIAT informed so actually we can help you both of us I believe can help you to develop a more efficient work plan you know how we can actually make use of the funds or resources more efficiently. and uh, uh, actually I'm also working with CIAT 
And we try to actually to uh, work with all MPPOs to cover not only CMD, but also other transbounded plan paths to, uh, you know, uh, to improve the capacity of, uh, uh, you know, at the national and the regional levels. And also more importantly, to really to uh, raise the ownership of MPPOs, how we can actually work together to, uh, you know, tackle uh, you know, this uh, 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 emergence and re-emergence of transboundary plant pests in this region. So we need to work together, work as always as one team to, you know, to deliver uh, the benefit to the country, to the people, to the farmers. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Dr. Bo. Is there any other questions for Consulvan before we, we move on? <coughs> okay, I don't see any, any hands. <coughs> so, um, yeah, as I mentioned at the start, the, the project has been receiving in-kind support from, from Thai institutions, particularly uh, Kessasat University and the Thai Tapioca Development Institute. And once again, we're very grateful for their contributions to the project. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Wanwisa is not able to join us today, um, but she did send some information just to update update people. So I'm going to to share that. <coughs> uh, um, but please, uh, I can see Dr. Vichan and, and Dr. Chiramsak online and others. Please uh, jump in at the end, and I've I've got some questions for you to maybe update. Um, updates a bit more. So this, this map I actually uh, pulled out of King's presentation from the inception meeting when uh, things in Thailand uh, were not so bad. Um, CMD had arrived in the border regions and, and they had uh, developed various risk areas for, for surveillance. Um, but as it stands today, this is the slide based on the DOA's uh, update in in October. Uh, currently, the infected fields are in 28 provinces and estimated to be around 50,000 hectares. Um, but cumulative, so if you add the areas that have been eradicated, uh, CMD has been present in 32 provinces uh, and around 70,000 hectares. I think the, the important thing is that it's not now just located around the area around around Cambodia um, and that STEM movement has moved it to the, the border with Myanmar. Uh, and we know that in this area here in Myanmar, there's currently expansion of cassava production and links to Thai factories. So uh, we're really looking to work with Myanmar partners once we can travel again, um, and, but we may have to find other ways to do that. And again, working with FAO, um, team to prioritize some of these areas in, in Myanmar. Um, also, this area in, in, in Laos, uh, important to see what's happening. Um, the district here is one of the largest producing areas in Laos. Um, so, yeah, and then, and also um, some, some northern areas. So, uh, yeah, the situation has very much moved on in the last 12 months. Uh, but I put this together just to kind of calm people down, but this is where I, I'd be very interested for some input from our Thai colleagues. Um, so officially, yeah, so this area in, in uh, Nakhon uh, Ratchet uh, Sima, Korat, you know, in terms of the total area, there is still a lot of hectares that aren't impacted. And as you can see, um, once you get, this is just the ranked in, area of infected fields. So you can see, you can't even see once you get past around here. Um, so the area, the official area of production infected is, is relative, relatively low, but I, I'd welcome some feedback um, from industry partners and, and, and also researchers on, on maybe some less official uh, observations. And then the other thing would be great to get an up date from if, if someone from Thailand 
can update us. There was talk a few months ago of quite a significant, um, well, the officials were seeking a $1.4 billion, uh, billion baht mosaic disease fund. Uh, you know, what, what has happened in terms of policy and, and working with farmers and eradication? I'm, I'm sure that all our partners in other countries that have been trying to deal with eradication would be, it would be an interesting area to share insights of what's worked and, and what hasn't. Um, so that's the update that I've received from, from King. Um, is anyone from Thailand happy to give, give a personal update on, on the current situation? Um, Dr. Wichan, I can see you listening intently. Would you, would, would you have any, in terms of the area around Korat, do you think the area infected is beyond kind of what the current official status is? Is it starting to impact the processes and, and we're seeing reductions in supply? No. Dr. Jeromsak, would you like to share anything on the current situation? Yes. I think the, the, the total wood production this coming year is still, you know, still, uh, still uh, sufficient. You know the the reduction. I I I, I follow the, the estimation and survey by the the stars association. They they still uh, enough supply for the stash industry, and then they 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 report that the, the demand for the cassava chip to China you know, is uh, still. Uh, increase, but uh, the 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 price, <laughs> the price of cassava road is not so high, you know. Uh, and uh, in the area, you know, I I, I we did uh, some research test testing field in in Sakel. Sakel is near Cambodian uh, uh, border. It used to be really serious in that area, but uh, the farmer, you know, know that, you know, and they change the variety. They, they throw away the, the, the crown number 89, that fully susceptible. And they change to Kasesat 50, Hoi Bong 60, and some to uh, Rayong 9. And Rayong 72 is uh, the field in that area, you know. Last two years were really, really badly damaged, but now it's look better with the new, uh, not a susceptible variety, you know. But I have not, uh, I have not, uh, I have not uh, traveled a lot in the farmer field, mainly at TTDI and Sakel. But the next uh, coming uh, growing season in April, May, they try to find the, the government by the Department of Agricultural Extension. They find they try to find the, the clean you know, planting material of the Kasesa 50 and Rayong 72 into Korat to replace the, the susceptible one. You know. I'm not so sure, you know, it uh, will be uh, how the, the project will uh, succeed, you know. And uh, this week, a team from the, 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 of the Deputy Minister of uh, Agriculture, who in charge in the cooperative will visit Bichan and I at Hoi Bong 
to see uh, the, the to see the our project that uh, rapid propagation of Kaseisa 50 and Huibo 60 at, at TTDI to see how can we cooperate uh, cooperate with the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture mainly Department of uh, Cooperative Extension you know in that area you know in this this uh, this week we will discuss together to see at the uh, you know. Mm. Okay, great. Um, I've got a question for Dr. Vuti. I mean, we see in Southern Lao uh, that most farmers are still growing rayon 72 and mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot, not much infection. And in Cambodia, you're going to struggle to find a source of clean planting material. Dr. Vuti, do you think that we should explore opportunities for moving planting material rayon 72 from from uh, Sullivan where, where there's no CMD into southern into Cambodia is that an option that you would like us to explore I think we could we could do or we must do and to to find the new variety that can be resistant to the CMD because previously we had only the KU50 the, 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 the was the popular to the grower but on this variety also we got the diseases but I think I think if we have the connection or we have someone to, to supply us the new variety, that had performance in in Thailand or in in any country, we are happy to to conduct the experiment in Cambodia, or we would like to change the new variety to get. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the new, new varieties are already in Cambodia in terms of resistant varieties. They're currently uh, getting transferred in at Kadi. But for the coming season, farmers are going to be very anxious to get some clean material. Uh, we know that from the, the trials that we're conducting at Champkalo, funded by CAVAC, that, that KU50 and, and Rayon72 perform much better than other varieties. Uh, and it, it would be, I mean, we can start to look at the, the costs of transportation and sourcing material in Southern Laos um, you know, and whether it, whether it makes sense, but, but it, we would have to collaborate very closely with your office in terms of the quarantine and the arrangements to, to, to get that across the border. And of course, current situation where people can't cross the border is going to make those collaborations challenging. But I think on, on just working out back of the envelope, whether it's going to work and farmers would, would be interested to, to grow it. Uh, we can we can start to do yeah okay. so is there other questions uh, the floor is now open to ask questions to to all the presenters that have presented so far yeah let 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 uh, let me uh, comment one thing you know I have uh, I have no, no. experience let, let, can 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 I can I speak? Yeah. I have a uh, no experience with the uh, rayon seventy two, but in the field, in the farmer, you know many many report that uh, rayon seventy two is uh, less infection, and we include it in in the big uh, plot at Sakao. I think at the uh, next early year, you know next year. We have the confirm uh, resort and the clapping in the in the field how to, but by our past experience, you know, long time ago, when the this uh, I, I I comment on the on the as the 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 the, the, the breeder, uh, long time ago when they released the rayon seventy two, the chipping chip factory they complain that, you know. Uh, rayon 72 after dry from the cement floor 
and keep in the storage at uh, at the uh, absorb water. So it's not uh, they complain that uh, they are at that time you know the the they, I, I say as the scientist the the Kasawa Trade Association ask not to multiply the rayon seventy two because uh, the problem of drying and reabsorb of water you know but you know for the start factory the root content is uh, okay a little bit you know lower than the say SAT 50 but start factory is no problem just extract the, the start and dry it in the dry season if Cambodia you know, use this variety I, I, I be careful Mm. After they, they chop and dry, I don't know if they store in, in the sack, you know. But we we, 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 we don't have that uh, research on that, you know. Just uh, careful about the uh, chip by the small farmer. But to start factories, real no problem. And you harvest in the dry season, November, January, February, is no problem. And that that uh, if if it if it expand if something happen to the small farmer I worry about that because of the past experience you know talk with the, yeah. the trader yeah. okay keep in mind Great. That. thank you thank you very much for sharing that yeah that's very useful is there a, I, there was someone else trying to ask a question no. yeah yes Dr. Oh. Sure. Oh, I already uh, tested the variety P two P T and Rayong seventy two. And I spent a lot in Cambodia and Chiang Kalu, so I I collected the data. I see the CMB affected thirty percent to eighty percent. I I cannot. In a few around. The UVT uh, affected by CMT, the clean planting material. UVT so affected about 13 percent, one three. One three, percent. yeah. About three percent and uh, Rajon 72 about 18, one eight percent. Yes. The recent two variety uh, clean planting material. We planted uh, diversity, but we got the CMB. We can say a very fitting person, one five person. CMB in Jongkalu. Okay, thanks, Baron. Yeah, so yeah, it's important to note that these varieties we're talking about now are not resistant. These are the current varieties that are less susceptible, and we have a lot of trials um, that, that GDA and, and, and CR has been conducting in Cambodia. It's, we we know that they perform better. The yield penalty is not too bad if you start with clean planting material and they don't get infected very quickly. Um, but the situation in Tainin, we've also seen that is they do get infected quite quickly there. So uh, um, yeah, but in the short term this year, as, as, as everyone knows, the price is good. The demand for chips is very high. Uh, I think uh, China with maize prices going up is looking again to Southeast Asia to supply, to supply uh, cassava chips. So um, yeah, it will be interesting to see what farmers do uh, in Cambodia this year. We're, we're still on time and with that, I'm going to uh, ask if Mike uh, Mason, Dr. Mike Mason from UQ can share his screen. You might remember Mike from the inception meeting who is working uh, with Jimmy Botella to develop the diagnostic droid. Uh, and he's going to give us an update on where they're up to and the next steps. Thanks, Mike. All right. Uh, yeah, so can everyone hear me and see the screen? Yes, thanks. Go ahead. Okay, so I was, hello everyone to start with. Um, so I'm just going to go through sort of what I've been doing. Here we are. Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to sorry, Mike. Can you can you go up to your display setting and change it to not presenter view? Oh, okay. 
Uh, up, so, up. So, yeah. what, what do you want? Click that. Yeah, click that. And, and then go up to display settings. Yeah. And right. yeah, that one, the top one. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, mate. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm trying to create a, a, a fields, uh, uh, a field ready test for, for CMV. Um, and the, the, the goal of this, so to make it work on the field, uh, obviously it's different from when it's in the lab. So we, it needs to be uh, easy to use. Uh, the, the, the typical equipment that you use in a, in a lab, um, you, you really, it's impractical to, to bring that out into the field. Um, so we, we need to have minimal equipment. Obviously, cost is important. If it's doesn't matter how good a test is, if it's if it's really expensive, you know, it's just not going to be used at all. Uh, and then obviously, it has to be uh, robust. Uh, you know, so when when you do it, you can rely on those results. So so that's the the goal of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so the first step, obviously, is to get some primers. So I'm using. Uh, lamp technology, which uh, if you're familiar with PCR, it's just a different DNA amplification technology that um, instead of using multiple temperatures, just uses a single temperature. Um, so I've designed uh, a bunch of primers and, and tested them out on the samples that I have. Um, and so this is this is three of the, the primers that, that I've got and um, they show, so, so when you uh, sorry, they're showing what, what you want to see, which is when you test healthy cassava plant, you don't get any amplification. And when you test cassava plants that have been infected with uh, CMV, uh, you, you can see the, the amplification pattern. And if you've never seen lamp amplification, this is what it looks like. It's, it's not a single band, it, it's, it's multiple bands. So I've got now, uh, and it's five, uh, five primer sets, which uh, all seem to be specific for CMV. Uh, that's, that's really good because that gives me uh, some options if, if later down the track I find there's a problem with one, I can uh, swap it out for another one and I, I should be okay. So that's, that's quite good. The next step uh, is the DNA extraction method. So this is the, the tricky thing because again, you want to be able to do this in the field. Um, so again, you, you want to keep it really simple, minimum number of steps, minimum amount of equipment. Um, and so I've been playing around with a lot of different um, conditions, uh, different buffers, different um, uh, amounts of tissue, different ways of sort of breaking the tissue up. Um, to give you an example of some of those, um, so this is this is what I, I have been doing. So this is a, on the left here. We see uh, tubes with some uh, steel ball bearings. You can see a ball bearing in there, uh, and then basically you just. Uh, you shake the, the tube and, and you can see that it breaks up the tissue. That works quite well. Um, but what I found, you know, after you do the 10th the one of those, your arm's getting pretty tired. So I, I, I tried to get a, a, a better method. Uh, and one of the things I tried was just getting a, a plastic uh, lunch bag, putting a couple of mils of extraction buffer uh, in the solution. Uh, and then uh, grinding it up with your, your hand. In this case, I also tried some sand, but uh, later on I found the sand is not necessary at all. Um, so the final, cutting long story short, the, um, the final um, process for extracting uh, is quite similar to this. So you, you basically you just grind the sample up in the plastic bag, you use the dipstick. So Wil Wilma was uh, talking about the dipsticks that we created. Uh, Basically, what the dipsticks do is they, they bind the DNA really quickly. Uh, so you can um, you dip it into your solution, they, they bind the DNA, and then you dip it into a, a wash solution, which removes the contaminants. And then you can elute directly by uh, dipping the, the DNA into your amplification reaction. So it's very, very quick uh, and avoids all the sort of machinery that you, you usually use. All right, so that's, that's the extraction part. Um, the, the next thing was the, uh, looking at getting the diagnostic droid in a much more um, usable format. So, so for those of you who are not familiar, I, I developed this device. Basically, it's a, it's a, 
It's a portable amplification device uh, and it's, it's really simple to use. It just has this single button. It's got a screen to tell you what to do and what the results are. And if you want, you can use an SD card and record all the, the data. The, um, the device uses artificial intelligence to look at uh, the amplification in real time. Uh, and it, it will call whether a sample is positive or negative for you. Um, that's, that's really important because that eliminates uh, human bias. Uh, so it's just a, a cold calculation. Uh, you know, yes, it's positive, no, it's not. Um, it runs, it can run from mains power or, or a car battery. So that's great. So you can either use it in a lab setting just by pl plugging into the wall or you can plug it into your, your car if you happen to be in the, the field. Um, so the problem with the, the droid previously was um, this is what it looks like on the inside. There's a, there's a lot of parts uh, to that and, and I had to solder all those parts myself um, to put this thing together. The whole thing to, to make one of these took about a week to, to do and it's just because it's very fiddly work. If you make a mistake, uh, it takes long time to find out where the, the bad solder joint was or, or whatever. So what we've done now is I've got the, um, got the design uh, made as a printed circuit board and uh, with the components automatically populated onto the board. Um, so that saves a lot of that fiddly, fiddly work. Obviously, I still have to make all these um, the wires and connect those up and, and Still, there's a lot of assembly. You have to glue all the parts together, but it's it's a lot less work now. So it probably saves a couple of days worth of work uh, for each one of these droids, which is which is a big time saver. And this will help uh, when we want to make a make a bunch of them, send them out to the different uh, countries. Um, so putting all that together, so this is what we've got now. So the um, the the diagnostic system is is you do your extraction from your plant, which you can do in the field. All these sort of things you can prepare, I didn't mention before, prepare in advance. So before you go out to the field, you can prepare, put the um, extraction buffer in, in the, the bags and, and put the, the buffer into, into the tubes. Um, so then when you're out in the field, all you need to do is just grind up the, the tissue in the bag, use the dipsticks to, to purify the DNA. Once you've got this tube, which is your amplification tube, with your, your DNA in it, you put that straight into the device um, and you're done. You push, push the button and you go. Um, so that's, you can see, you know, how I've worked to try to make it really, really simple. I've got a video, which I'm not sure if it's going to play, but we'll, we'll try. Let me know if there's a problem with this. So basically it just, I prepared a video so you can sort of see the whole process because uh, I think it kind of helps uh, to, to understand the, the simplicity of the whole thing. So I'll play it now. Is this playing okay so far? Yeah, it's fine, mate. Good. So, so this is the droid. So, so the first thing to do is obviously to to get the thing set up. Uh, that's very simple. Obviously, you just uh, plug it in, turn it on, and it fires up. It does a bunch of its uh, little checks, creates a file on the SD card, and then tells you to push the button to to start. Uh, once you push the button, it'll heat up. To 65 degrees. Meantime, you can go off and start doing your your extractions at this point. It'll it'll take care of itself. So it gets up to a temperature and then just sits there and waits for you. Um, now this is the extraction part. Um, so what we're using. So we found just a, a six centimeter piece of leaf tissue in in buffer in the the plastic bag, and you just smash it up with your um, with your fingers. Um, and that's, that's all you need to do. And then you use the dipsticks, you just sort of lean the, the bag down, dip the dipstick in the solution. And then off you go into, this is the wash buffer. So you dip into the wash buffer to remove the contaminants. And then, um, and then you dip into the, the amplification reaction. I'm doing this slow for the camera. I usually do this a lot faster. No, that's it. And so that's that's all you need to do. And then that just goes into the, the droid. Um, 
put the lid on, push the button, um, and that's it. So it, it looks, it, it, it knows there's one tube in there and then tells you how much time to go. So, and that's it. So then uh, the results will be returned. So it'll tell you on the screen, we'll say this, this sample was positive or this one was negative. Uh, that's all you have to do. And so that's the idea. It's just super, super simple to, to use. Um, actually, while well, I've got you, um, I noticed, um, Wilma, you used, um, you're using dipsticks. I'll see if I can wind this back a bit. The, um, the actual, you can see the color of the liquid there in the, the extract. What it looked like you were using a, uh, too much tissue uh, and it was, because you had a really dark green solution. And what I found is if you, if you overload it, uh, the, you'll get some of that, some of the uh, plant material into the actual extract and you'll start to inhibit the reaction. So you, less is kind of more with these dipsticks. It, it doesn't have to be um, a really dark green. It's, and it's best that it's not. It's best that it's just a light green um, extraction. All right, uh, so I'll get out of that. Oh, how do I end this? <laughs> Oops, don't need to do it. Okay, back there. Oops, and I'll do that one again. Okay, so uh, the next steps. Um, so I've only sort of recently got those all those parts together. So uh, I just need to do a little bit more uh, work just to make sure that. Um, it's, it's working well. I want to look at sort of some um, uh, dilution series. I'm going to spike some CMV samples with different um, amounts of, of, sorry, spike some cassava samples with different amounts of CMV and see how, um, how well they work, figure out which, which is the, the better primer to use. Um, something I'd like to do, which is probably not essential right now, but um, I'd like to eliminate the, the cold chain for the reagents. So right now, um, uh, the, I can actually, I can freeze dry the reagents, but I'm losing a lot of activity. So uh, right now it's better if you just use the, um, prepare the samples sort of fresh. Um, you can prepare them in the morning and then take them out in the field. Um, um, that would be fine, but just long-term, they, they, um, uh, yeah, for, for shipping is kind of a bit of a problem. So I'm, I'm trying to work on that one. Um, the next thing which I want to do um, uh, early next year sometime is to, to send a, the droid and some consumables to uh, some collaborators uh, and work with the collaborators uh, to, to troubleshoot the, um, any problems that might occur um, so we can sort of uh, get some robustness built into that whole, whole system and, and make sure it works. Usually I do this myself, but obviously with the, the COVID, uh, I'm not going to be able to travel. So I... I'm going to need to work with collaborators there. Um, the other thing I'm doing is working to um, adapt this for, for uh, cassava witches broom as well. Uh, I'm having a lot of trouble uh, with that. Um, there's uh, limited uh, sequence information for cassava witches broom. Um, and uh, actually listening to, to Wilman's talk where he said, um, uh, I think it was 23%. Uh, of, of the symptomatic samples actually tested positive. So I, I think that's a real problem for me because I've only got a few samples right now. Um, I have been sent some samples. So, so actually thanks to, to uh, Noi, Hote and, and King for, for sending uh, samples, but I, I do need a lot more uh, samples. Um, and if anyone can help with, um, with getting some more information, uh, like if, if more sequence information on uh, Cassava Witch's Broom, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. And that's, that's it. Um, let me know if you've got any questions. Thanks, Mike. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let other people go first. Otherwise, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, hi, Mike. Hey. Uh, that's a good Good presentation. Thank you for the video. Mike, I have got a question about, I saw there was eight holes. Yes. There were eight holes that you put the samples. Yep. And, uh, uh, but, but you get one result or are we getting result of each hole that which one is positive and which one is negative? Yeah, 
Yeah, it'll it'll say the the tube in uh, well number five is is positive. You know that that sort of thing. So it tells you which which okay. hole is positive. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Hope to see you soon. Yes. <laughs> So, Mike, with the rapid multiplication tunnels that we're creating, um, one tunnel takes around 40 large stems, so maybe coming from 20 to 30 plants. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you, rec if we wanted to like test every stem that goes in, because that's not that many, but would you recommend doing every plant separately, or could you combine, you know, two yeah, leaves for example? I think pulling the samples makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, there's no reason why you'd want to do it just individually. Yeah, I mean, I think we could we could have it as three three plants per per well, um, and, and you would cover the whole the whole tunnel, um, which would which would be great. Um, I, I, yeah, I can see the priority is testing it with a lot more asymptomatic plants Good. to make we sure. Cannot cannot hear you. <laughs> Am I on mute? Can other people hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the asymptomatic plants are going to be the issue. I mean, if there's clear symptoms, you know, obviously we wouldn't use those anyway. Um, yeah. So yeah, once we get it over here, it'd be important to match up with the PCR test to see, you know, are we having success yep. in getting, getting that? Yep. Hi, Mike. Hey. Wilmer here. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> um, um, we have a bunch of, of, of samples already we tested with CTAP, so we have the results. will be good because we, we still have some of the dry leaf uh, material there to mm -hmm. double test, to check with, the, with your, with your uh, yeah. lamp. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Would be, that, would be, that would be very useful. And uh, I have one question. What uh, region of the virus are you targeting with these primers? Different genes or? Yes, there are. I've, I've got, um, I don't, can't remember the actual gene, but so I've got uh, a, a target on the, the B chromosome as well as another target on the A chromosome. Okay. I've got multiple. Multiple genes. genes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Is there other questions? So Mike, in terms of mass production, is there any progress kind of on, on uh, yeah, bringing this to a commercial scale? Has UniQuest got interested or are you still oh, struggling? That's, that's been really disappointing. So I, I was trying to get, get that happening and it's, it's just not gonna happen, at least not through UQ. I don't know if anyone else here can actually help getting get these things manufactured, but uh, other than that, it's just me doing it. Uh, and they they do take, you know, even with the new circuit board and stuff, they're still taking, I don't know, uh, you know, probably three days to make just with all the 3D printing and stuff that's in, involved. It's Someone's doing it right. I'll see if I can mute them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So any of our partners, I'm sure there's plenty of Vietnamese and Cambodian uh, tech companies that would would maybe be interested. You know, if we can demonstrate our market and uh, that they're useful. Always the the chicken and egg issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a it's just a problem in this stage. Like, you know, if you if you only want, you know, twenty or thirty of these things, it, it's quite expensive. But you know, if you wanted ten thousand, it, it probably wouldn't be much of a problem. Yes, Mike, I would like to know the the price of your equipment of your equipment for analysis. You already finalized the price, the cost of this machine. Um. Yeah. All well, right. That's the thing. So it's not commercially manufactured. So it's just just made by by me. Um, so uh, like I don't I don't know. Yeah, you know, if we we're going to sell it, how much we'd sell it for. 
Um, I think the parts alone, I think costs. Um, now, like, I've now got a uh, aluminium block. Uh, the, what you saw in the video was a, um, a, a plastic block, and that's aluminium. That one costs, I think, about $600, $700. Um, just, the problem is it's because it's all you know, manufactured on a small scale. If we got it manufactured on a larger scale, it, the cost would go down quite a lot. Thank you. Hello, can I have a question for Wilma? Yeah, sure, we'll go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Wilma. Um, I saw on PES this place that there was a um, CMD uh, problem in India in the year of like 2011. But afterwards, uh, you don't see that anymore. So are you familiar with the situation in India? Or did they eradicate uh, CMD in India? Hi, Boo. Um, I've been in contact with uh, Dr. Makesh Kumar. He was in, in one of our meetings in, in the region. Sri Lanka Kasama Saivar is still there. It's more like an endemic problem, but it's not causing much, much uh, um, Losses, but still there. So it's still there. It's not eradicated. Yeah. No. Okay. Because like we don't we don't see it on the map anymore. Yeah, there are no there are no more official reports. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mike. We're going to move on to the last presentation. Uh, we are running out of time. So, um, Marie Isabel. Could you share your screen and, and give us an update on your activities? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and see your screen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jono. Well, um, I'm gonna make an update and I'm planning on tell about some plans for research of wildlife. Uh, so, uh, I want to start by, by bringing up two important points. In 2016, um, in some things carried out in Cambodia and Vietnam, it was found that of 150 samples of white flies, 149 belonged to the cryptic species Asia 21, and only uh, was it identified as Asia 26. And Early this year was reported that under laboratory conditions and on, tab on tobacco, Asia 21 has a percentage of uh, Sri Lanka cassava mosaic virus transmission of more than 80%. So that is the confirmation uh, uh, for the transmission by this cryptic uh, species. Mm, therefore, one of our object objectives is to know and understand the distribution and diversity of the wildfly populations uh, throughout the cassava production regions in Southeast Asia. Mm, for this, we standardized a randomized sampling methodology um, that will uh, allow us to efficiently sample a large number of fields. So uh, first, we established that it's possible to survey uh, the second youngest leaf. The first, uh, I don't know if you can see my, my point. Yeah, we can. OK, thanks. Um, that is the first uh, leaf that had the lobes expanded, this one. So um, in, usually in Africa, um, where use the uh, are used the first fifth leaves to count the number of adults in a and in a field. So we established that uh, the second leaf um, can be uh, um, is the preferred by adults, and it's highly probable that uh, if there's adult in the field, we will find them under this leaf. And here you can see a uh, two key analysis uh, where you uh, we uh, where we compare the uh, fifth 
leaves and it's uh, evident that the second leaf is different to the other ones and always have more uh, white flies than the others. Okay, um, the next step is uh, to establish, um, sorry. <laughs> the next step uh, was to establish how many samples we, do we need, we need to take in each field. So basically we take 99 uh, plants in a field of almost one hectare and uh, made a randomized analysis of those plants in groups of 10, 20, 30, and 10, 10 to 10 until uh, 90. And we found that um, with 30 samples or 30 plants, uh, we have a um, uh, high reduction in the error, in the standard error compared with 20. So um, as we need a, a rapid method to uh, uh, know how is the population of white flies in a field, uh, we choose 30. Um, 30 also allow us to take, um, to have samples in a time of 24 minutes. That is just for white flies. Um, we develop a macro to uh, count the number of adults in the leaves. Uh, is th this is called NIMSTAR. And basically, um, this take uh, this analyze the photographs, and um, you can have different backgrounds with soil with different lights, and you can uh, you can have a, a count uh, of white flies with a correlation of more than ninety percent. And this is the res resolution that we have for the. Um, uh, from the white uh, photographs that we use to train the, um, the macro. Um, also then the next step after to standardize all the, all the methods we made the trainings that all the collaborators, uh, co the colleagues uh, talking about. The, we developed protocols, brochures, videos, and also made virtual meetings and uh, um, continuous. Uh, and we made continuous communication in by email and WhatsApp and other uh, mediums. Well, um, until now, uh, we we develop all the we standardize all the methods. But when we uh, started the practice in the field, we found that we have some problems. As uh, for instance, the, ang the angle in which is taken the, the picture or the leaf that is choose uh, to, to be evaluated. Here, for instance, we have a, a leaf possibly is the third or the fourth leaf. And the preferred one is this one. So some, sometimes we have that those problems. Also, um, if you have well, some bright zones in the leaf, the NIMSTAR uh, cannot count the number of white flies. And the other, the other problem was the resolution of the pictures or the photographs that we can share in the, in the SharePoint uh, folder that we use. But uh, right now we have more than 6,500 photos uh, uh, which can be useful to uh, develop a new uh, improvement for our macros. So uh, basically we decided to make a manually counting of the white flies uh, in each photograph. Um, this, has, uh, this process has so, some problems. For instance, here you can see two photographs uh, in the same uh, region. And in the left, you see, you can see a white fly. Basically, you can differentiate white fly to a nymph of Melibac because the size. And um, you can use the nails 
of the collector as a pattern to compare the size of the nail with the insect that you are counting. So this is other problem that you can have if you are using a macro or a software to count the uh, white spots, basically. So the process was to, to check uh, leaf by leaf uh, making a zoom in, in all the areas. At the end, we have a database with uh, data of number of adults and all the data of location. Um, just in few cases, we have data um, of varieties, for instance, and it's something that is very important as, as you were talking about, because um, as some varieties are uh, resistant or susceptible to the virus or to the diseases also, they are resistant to white flies and white flies also uh, prefer some varieties. So I think it's a, a, an important that data that we need to um, try to add uh, to the database. So um, at the end, we have um, 44 fields from Cambodia with uh, all the data of coordinates and, and date of collection. 48 fields from Laos, 125 from Vietnam. And here we, we are using a scale of uh, from zero to four that um, um, aggregate the number of uh, adults that we found in 30 plants or per field. So for a scale zero, we have zero white flies in the field. A scale one is one to five adults. A scale two is six to 10. A scale three is 11 to 100. And four is plus 100. And this is um, equivalent to the average uh, that we found the average of adults per leaf per plant. So, but uh, I think it's easily to see um, the number of white flies. So here we have that for a scale one, that is uh, one to five adults. In Cambodia, we have a, the 70% 70, uh, 70 of the fields have uh, this scale of adults. Um, and in this sense, it's very interesting that in, in Vietnam, 77.6% uh, of the fields are free of white flies. Um, now we can say, we can watch some maps about the distribution of white flies and the abundance. So here we have Laos. In Laos, um, we found that in the in the north there there is a population until until six to ten adults. Here we can see um, an average of zero point twenty five. That is uh, um, more or less uh, six six uh, white flies per field. That is uh, in one leaf, as I show you how we, we made uh, something for the surveillance. In these graphs, you can see Laos, uh, South Laos, and uh, also uh, we have uh, most most of the fields have from one to five white flies. Um, but in the south, as you as you as know each show uh, about the CMD, we have some uh, points, some fields that has uh, between eleven uh, to. Uh, 100, that is uh, one, uh, an, an average of one, that means that uh, this, this point, this point here, one of these has um, 30, uh, 30 white flies in the field. Here is the map for Cambodia. So here we can see that in Cambodia is, uh, there is, there is a field in which we have more than uh, 100 uh, adults in the field. Uh, it was 140 adults. Um, you can see this is, is this, this is the point. But um, as, I, as I was expecting, 
because the, the um, frequency of CMD in Cambodia, the populations are not so high. You can see that most of the, of the fields have uh, between one to five uh, wildflies per field. For Vietnam, sorry that this is not, this is uh, animation is bad. Uh, from Vietnam in the north, most of the of the fields are free from of wildflies, and we have just one point that has a, between eleven to a hundred um, wildflies. This is the point that has zero zero point two. That means six six wildflies per field. And in the center of Vietnam, uh, we have uh, the, uh, mostly, most of the fields have zero white flies. And in the south, we have in uh, close to Cambodia, a point, uh, one point with um, uh, in between 11 and 100 is more or less um, at 15, 15 white flies per field. Here we can see uh, something that mentioned Wilmer that we have some problems in the in the coordinates that um, give us uh, the GPS. So we we have to make some improvement in, in the in the uh, when 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 we obtain the this data. And here, as a summary, we found that in Cambodia the average of white flies per leaf per plant is 0 0.23, while in Laos is 0 0.16, uh, and in Vietnam is 0 0.02. But maybe is uh, you can see you can go to the field and see a lot of white flies. But if you compare with Colombia, for instance, this is for another species, but you can find 128 per uh, leaf, while in Africa, uh, this is a report um, from 2019, um, we have, a, as I mentioned, they evaluate five leaves per plant and they found, found 500 uh, white flies. However, this was the start in Africa for the populations of white flies. So it's important not just to um, evaluate and found um, solutions for the virus, but also for the white flies populations. Because in Africa, uh, uh, some years ago, several years ago, the population saw break and um, right now are, uh, are super abundant in many places. Um, the next step basically is uh, the samples that uh, were collected in different in the different places uh, will be evaluated to how to know the genetic diversity of wildflies using a, a barcoding, basically with a mitochondrial coi um, marker. And we made the first assay with the samples uh, sent by Laos team. Uh, we used uh, the standard koi primers that were that are used for other animals, and for 20 samples that were that we received, just five were amplified using PCR. And in the method that we use, we uh, we we don't um, make DNA extraction extraction, um, but uh, we found that um, several of the samples we have. Uh, bad quality, the, the, the white flies maybe were uh, dry and lose uh, pieces of uh, legs. So um, we need to evaluate if it's uh, something in the process, uh, in the collection, or maybe, for instance, uh, we suggest to use um, absolute ethanol that is 96%. So I, I think we need to work a little more in the preservation of the white flies. However, we are gonna make another test with the, with the remaining 15 samples, um, trying to obtain DNA extraction to make the, um, the identification of the white flies. So thank you, and if you have questions, please.
Thanks, Maria. Yeah, so if there's questions for Maria, please uh, please raise your hand or open your, your mic. Sure, you no, know, may I ask a question? Yeah, please, Ema. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Juno, for inviting me here. And it's really a pleasure to be here to see how is the progress of the um, CMD in Southeast Asia. I have worked uh, with Kasafa since 2009, and I learned that there is no virus at all in Indonesia. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm I'm the only Indonesian here, but uh, I'm, I mean, uh, so in this opportunity, I'd like to ask Wilmer probably and Maria, how high is the change or the opportunity the virus will come to Indonesia? Because we also have uh, wet flies and Gemini virus, Pigomo viruses uh, in Indonesia, but they they are not uh, they don't infect uh, cassava plants, but other heart, other plants. So, uh, will we get these uh, viruses from these wet flies, or um, it's only because of the the cassava germplasm imported from other countries to Indonesia? Thank you, Jono. Okay, I, I don't know if Wilmer want to answer this, but I, I can, I can say that if, um, in first, um, first uh, the biotype of the white fly is important, or the cryptic species. Uh, for instance, I know that a uh, MEM one um, that is a very invasive white fly. Um, cannot transmit the, the Sri Lankan cassava uh, mosaic virus. So the, mm -hmm. the species of white fly is, is important. And also, um, if, if we compare the, uh, the maps of CMD with the maps of white fly, uh, it's just in some cases are related, are correlated, the presence of white flies with the disease. So, uh, so uh, maybe it's too early to conclude something, but um, I think that the the, the movement of a uh, material um, with virus is the main uh, source of the disease in a region, in a new region. Okay. So the wet fly from, uh, for example, from Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, and Thailand will not come to Indonesia, I guess, because it's quite far. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, we we hope <laughs> we hope that, that cannot be, but it is possible. Basically, uh, uh, for instance, MEM one uh, was a, a species that uh, f uh, started in, in in Europe and immigrate in to almost all the world. So the, the migration because white flies can fly, can fly uh, mm -hmm. uh, even five kilometers. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add to that. Uh, don't feel safe just because uh, <laughs> the white flies can fly too far. Because uh, if we remember what happened with the cassava mealybug. The mealybug can't fly at all, but it still traveled all the way to mm -hmm. every, you know, almost every little cassava area in Indonesia. So uh, we have to remember that there, there are also human factors that are transporting pests and diseases around. And that's, the, that's a very big risk for, uh, for Malaysia and Indonesia to, uh, yeah. to, to become infected by this disease. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Yes, Ima, just to add some, uh, just to reinforce the point that Eric and, and, and Marita are saying, yeah, the introduction, I mean, is more likely to be by contaminated material that inadvertently comes into the country. And the establishment of the disease will depend pretty much on the, on the presence of the vector or alternative cause in the, in the region. But the long distance and the high probability of introduction will be because of a contaminated material that looks healthy and, and it will not pass through, uh, you know, some tests that are required for quarantine um, introduction of material. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, 
uh, as new resistant varieties are released in mainland Southeast Asia, and if they, you know, are performing well, it's likely that someone in the industry will will introduce it to to uh, Indonesia at some point, quite possibly, you know, with the virus. Um, so to build the capacity of the Indonesian research institutions for receiving in vitro material, uh, so that material can be safely exchanged, uh, and the industry knows that it can be safely exchanged and through the formal methods is quite critical to stop stems going in suitcases. Um, maybe COVID slowed it a little bit since there's no planes, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's something that the industry needs to be aware that, that this threat is there. And just because something doesn't have symptoms doesn't mean it's safe. We're, we're quite far behind now if there's, but of course uh, it's, it's 10 30 10 nearly 11 at night in colombia but but um i'm happy to stay around whilst people have questions that but i understand some people have to to go other questions for anyone uh in today's sessions actually i had a question john for maria isabel about the white flies um yeah. i i was wondering uh I, I, I uh, learned a lot from your presentation, actually. I was very far behind on keeping up with the progress of the whitefly work. So thank you for that nice presentation. Um, I was wondering what kind of studies uh, are ongoing to understand the uh, variability of whitefly populations with weather, with climate, climate factors, because it seems quite important like to understand that seasonality of whitefly as well. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Maria Isabel. Okay, it's so about um, variability in populations. I mean, um, you mean uh, diversity or the number, the changes in the number of populations? Yeah, I'm more, I'm more concerned about the changes in number of population over the seasons, but also in different areas. Yes. Yeah, Re recently it was, pub was published a uh, paper about uh, using climax um about uh, the distribution of mem one that is a uh, very important in in other crops fortunately not in cassava uh, mem one uh, doesn't eat um doesn't feed on cassava but um they made an analysis about the changes in populations uh, with uh, climate change and yes basically uh, and, and that is very specific for different species for instance, here in Latin America, we have um, two main white flies, uh, Vemisia tabachi, uh, that is uh, MIEM1, and uh, Trelleurodes vaporariorum. And with the change in, in climate, the uh, white fly that was the, from the high lands is um, now in lower lands. So it's a, pro a big problem in other uh, crops. So the, uh, there is a very important um, uh, effect on the populations of white flies with the in, improve uh, of the of the worm or of the differences between the, the stations. Yeah, I suggest um, the areas where we're doing rapid multiplication and people in the field quite frequently that we try to uh, monitor the numbers throughout the year um, because we're going to be producing young plants and putting them in the field kind of all through the year uh, and maybe we have to change the timing of that to avoid certain peak periods um, yeah so maybe that's something we can discuss next year in terms of the, the planning of, of monitoring other questions can I ask a question, Jono? It's Serena here in Canberra. Of course. I wanted to know the people, first of all, thank you, Maria, for that presentation. I thought it was very interesting. Um, for the people that sampled the fields that had relatively high numbers of adults, I know they're not as high as uh, what we see in Africa, but I was wondering if those people observed sooty mould deposition on any of the plants, like if this is a species that, that might potentially be a problem at those numbers that we saw in those fields. And like, 
Uh, Noe or Dr. Hort or Dr. Vuti? So from, from um, on the upper surfaces of the lower leaves in those high numbers of fields. Probably not if no one's answering. I'm going to mm -hmm. say that's a no. <laughs> well, Serena, I, I could mention that uh, in the field, I, I have noticed that problem in areas with uh, with quite high white fly population, but it's typically spiraling white fly. Oh, so okay. Not, yeah. yeah, not not Bemisia tobacco. Okay. Eric, your hand stopped, but I think that's where Serena's question came from. So yes. Yes, sure. sorry. Yeah. You're, you're right. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's it's quite late. Um, so thank you to all the speakers for presenting the update. I know it's been a really challenging year for you guys in terms of lockdowns and getting out and then floods and steep hills and landslides. Um, but we uh, yeah, really appreciate that work. I think there's a, a lot of work to be done on, on getting that information out. Um, but we, we did see that farmers are becoming more aware in, in places that they haven't been aware where the disease has arrived, but I think there's some priority areas where it hasn't um, been found yet. So we don't have a situation where people are thinking this is a new variety for two years while it, while it builds up. Um, so uh, lots of work to do there in the, in the coming months as, as farmers finish the harvest and start to look for, for the planting material and, and the, the season ahead. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I, I think we had a great show up from all through the world, from partner countries and outside. Um, we appreciate the support. Um, we'll continue the webinar series next year. Wilma, did you want to wrap up anything for, for the team? Hi, Yona, thank you. Um, well, I, I will uh, call uh, for a meeting, um, maybe uh, by the end of this week or, or early. Yeah, at this week to go through the new updates in the platform. So how can you access your information, images, and, and also the information that Maria Isabel was, was presenting. But I think it would be important that you, you, you own this, um, the, the, the data that you are, you are uploading in the platform. Um, I'm still curious about the situation with cassava witches bloom in, in, in Cambodia and Vietnam, it seems, uh, and Thailand, yeah? It seems that uh, this year, uh, it was very hard to find uh, affected fields, significantly affected fields. That's that's uh, that's very interesting, and also I was curious about the the data that uh, Marisabel showed in the south of Laos, the high uh, higher numbers of white flies, and uh, that coincides with the, the region where the the, the, the first uh, reports of CMD in Laos uh, were, were found. That's that's very very interesting, and we should follow up on this on this on this finding. I just want to thank again the uh, all the all the teams. It was a really really good team effort and uh, thank you very much. Thanks Wilma. Yeah, I think next year working with Augusto's lab on the varieties, there's lots of things to kind of look at in terms of, you know, where are these white flies um, in terms of varieties? Is this the explanation between the low levels of CM, uh, which is broom uh, as the variety changed to, to the, the varieties that were more susceptible to CMD, but less susceptible to to witch's broom and, and what does that mean in terms of our short-term and long-term solutions in terms of variety composition. Um, so in Laos, we have rayon 72 that's, that's more susceptible to witch's broom, but good for CMD. If we start, you know, encouraging KU50 and, and rayon 72, will we see witch's broom re-emerge in, in the other countries? So all interesting questions for next year. Uh, everyone have a great new year. Uh, we look forward to catching up in 2021.